Last night, something north of 100 million people were glued to their internet and, and TV sets across the globe, watching one of the most talked about interviews in really decades of time anywhere in the world. And that was between Tucker Carlson and Vladimir Putin, which was broadcast last night on, on Tucker's uh, website to, to much fanfare. Uh, we talked about it a little bit last night in a rapid reaction. But as promised last night, we have today's show for you. We're, we're going to go into some more depth. And we have two extraordinary guests and experts to help break this down. Uh, first of all, we have Rebecca Koffler, uh, who is a strategic military analyst and author of Putin's Playbook. She literally wrote the book on Putin. So uh, we're going to really be wanting to dig into that. She's also the author of Cut to the News, a newsletter for independent thinkers, which we'll be talking about here more later. And then we also have... Another of uh, the favorites on our show, Raj Menon, who is uh, my colleague at Defense Priorities and also director of grand strategies at Defense Priorities and the author, which will come in handy in a minute, Conflict in Ukraine, uh, where he talks a lot about what happened uh, in, especially since 2014, which will also come in handy in this conversation shortly. First of all, folks, welcome here. We're really grateful to have you here. Thank you. Good to see you. And, and Raj, I hope you get to feeling better. I know you're kind of under the weather, actually have COVID, and you're still coming on the show today. So you're a trooper, and we're doubly grateful for having you well, on. Well, you know, Danny, for you, anything, right? <laughs> well, thank you. That's that's very kind of you. Let's, let's just jump right in, because I know our audience is really eager to get into this. The first thing I wanted to do, and you guys are both in particular, and, uh, and Rebecca, you also have some CIA background, uh, so I, I'm doubly interested in hearing your view on this topic here but both of you have some level of expertise. So I want to hear you both. Tucker started off this broadcast uh, by explaining that the first more than half hour, and I think it actually went longer than that, where Putin went on this almost stream of consciousness about extended history uh, of, of Russia and Ukraine and a bunch of other stuff. And most Americans were kind of rolling their eyes like, what are you talking about? Because it seems like a waste of time. And in fact, Tucker addressed that right off the top. One note before you watch. At the beginning of the interview, we asked the most obvious question, which is, why did you do this? Did you feel a threat, an imminent physical threat? And that's your justification. And the answer we got shocked us. Putin went on for a very long time, probably half an hour, about the history of Russia going back to the 8th century. And honestly, we thought this was a filibustering technique and found it annoying and interrupted him several times. And he responded he was annoyed. He did, actually, if you watch that. But I'm, I'm curious. So, Rebecca, first of all, why was history so important? Because Putin's not going to do something that he thinks is, is, is a waste of time. Because to an American, all that history was, they didn't even hear it. I doubt any of them remember a word of it. But Putin must have thought that's important. Why is that important to him to go through that much detail? Well, that's actually the crux of the matter, uh, Danny. Uh, it's the cultural differences between Russians and Americans. History is extremely important to the Russians. Um, and uh, I actually was just uh, laughing a few minutes ago. I listened to the interview in Russian. Last night, I listened it live in English and then in Russian. And I was laughing because Putin reminded me of my own dad. You know, you know that I was born and raised in, in Russia, right? And this is the baseline. This is how the Russians talk. But the second reason why uh, Putin did that is he is a former intelligence officer, KGB operative. So as we know, uh, the Russian intelligence services do a very in-depth study of Putin's interlocutor whoever is going to meet with him, right? To the point where if you sit across, you know, uh, Putin, uh, Putin knows, you know, if it's a male, like what perfume your wife wears, right? That's the oh, level wow. of detail. So as you noted, uh, he said to Tucker, I understand your baseline education is in history. So and Tucker said, yes. So Putin wanted A, to establish rapport uh, with Tucker. B, he wanted to establish dominance by what Tucker called his encyclopedic uh, knowledge of history. And C, he wanted, he was hoping that by explaining this in-depth history, he will uh, make a case that his invasion of Ukraine was legitimized. 
I see. And and so Raj, I know just before we came on the air, you were you also were talking about the the extended amount of time. And and I wonder if you can talk about it maybe from the aspect of for an American listener, uh, if Putin's trying to convey a message, uh, it probably was lost on most Americans because they it, it was I mean, they don't even want to go back into ancient history like the Civil War in our country, much less the literal 1800s, I think is how far back you went. Uh, what do you think his intention was? And did he just, did he miss misfire on this? So Danny, one thing that is clear that that this interview in quotation marks, because Tucker mm -hmm. barely said anything, was exquisitely choreographed from start to finish. So they had videos to cut in when Putin wanted to say something. He brought something from the Imperial archives, various props. So they were very well prepared and it's clearly an effort to influence the debate that's going on here. But what I found about the historical survey, which is accurate as far as it goes, it was a little potted history, was this. There's been a debate, and you know this well, Danny, what caused the invasion? Was it NATO expansion? Was that the thing? And if it hadn't happened, would Russia not have invaded? Or was it something bigger? And I have had a theory that I'll run by you, and I will say I don't have any evidence to back it up, but I've been watching Putin for a long time. And Rebecca's correct, by the way. If you listen to it in Russian, you get a much better flavor of what he's saying. Mm. During the COVID isolation period, Putin saw very, very few people. We know that he asked for archives from the imperial segment to be mm. brought to him. He was, really? reading wide, he was reading widely, particularly about Catherine the Great, and I think he was pondering his legacy in history. And so this one hour historical survey, the bottom line was that much of what is now Ukraine was territory gifted to that country by Russia. Ukraine is an artificial creation. The Russian people and Ukrainians are one people. He said that many times. Yeah. He blamed the Bolsheviks because the first Soviet constitution allowed for secession from the Union Republics, which Ukraine was. And so I think he wanted to make the case that uh, there's a rightful claim that Russia has on Ukraine. Now, what is important, and I'll stop with this, is that it puts into question the claim that it was all about NATO expansion. Because I, put, I do not think we can understand this war without realizing that there is no post-Soviet country that even comes close in Putin's eyes, for reasons that he explained, in equaling Ukraine status. That is the big that is the big I think that's a big man. point. Yeah, that, that's I think that's I, because to Americans they're they're all just if they can even find it on a map, they're all just kind of out there and they're all equal. They don't really make any distinction between them. But I think it's crucial to point out that to Putin, it very much does. And in fact, we're going to touch on that a little bit more in just a right. second. Just because, one other point, Danny. You know, he yeah, devoted sure. one hour to this, right? And whenever whenever Carlson tried to cut in, he just slapped him down. He was determined to finish this history lesson. Yeah, it actually made me feel a little uncomfortable the way he talked to me, but that's a separate issue. Uh, all right, I want to jump now into a couple of other things because we have a lot of things I want to hit. I want to make sure we get the most important things out while we still have you guys on here. First one I want to hit on is, to your point there, why he invaded. Tucker asked him, what was the thing that, that triggered you to actually go in then? And he had a different viewpoint. And I'll tell you, I remember it's it's been, especially in the first year or so of the war, uh, Putin was often quoted in Western media saying, we didn't even start this war. And, and of course, everyone just ridiculed that as, as being eye-rolling kind of disinformation. Obviously, they invaded in February 22. So it's just absurd at face value to even suggest he didn't. But as he talks about here, in his mind, it started earlier than that. You've said clearly that NATO expansion <coughs> eastward is a violation of the promise you all were made in 1990. It, it's a threat to your country. Right before you send troops into Ukraine, the vice president of the United States went to the Munich Security Conference and encouraged the president of Ukraine to join NATO. Do you think that was an effort to provoke you into military action? <sighs> I repeat once again, we have repeatedly, repeatedly proposed to seek a solution. 
to the problems that arose in Ukraine after 2014 coup d'etat through peaceful means. But no one listened to us. And moreover, the Ukrainian leaders who were under the complete US control suddenly declared that they would not comply with the Minsk agreements. They disliked everything there and continued military activity in that territory. And in parallel, that territory was being exploited by NATO military structures under the guise of various personnel training and retraining centers. They essentially began to create bases there. That's all. Ukraine announced that the Russians were a non-titular nationality while passing the laws that limit the rights of non-titular nationalities in Ukraine. Ukraine, having received all these southeastern territories as a gift from the Russian people, suddenly announced that the Russians were a non-titular nationality in that territory. Is that normal? All this put together led to the decision to end the war that neo-Nazis started in Ukraine in 2014. And then he went on to say, and, and therefore in February of 2020, we invaded to stop it. That that was his mentality. And Raj, I want to start with you this time, because I know your book covers a lot of the territory that he was talking about in there. And I want if you can kind of talk about the distinctions between what Putin's opinion is and what things look like from the other perspective on the Ukraine side. So 2014 was a very complicated event. Was the United States interested in a certain outcome during the Maidan, that is the uprising against Yanukovych? Absolutely. There is no way we can deny that. Were the Russians in, interested in a particular outcome? Yes, they absolutely were. There are certain things that need to be clarified. To paint the Maidan as pure and simple an American back coup d'etat, I think grossly underestimates the bottom-up rebellion that occurred. Putin is quite right to say that there was an agreement stitched together between the opposition and Yanukovych, which the Maidan people then rejected. But I think that picture that he presents is a little skewed. As for military bases, I know that we have a military training facility in Yaroiv in western Ukraine. But the idea that there were Russian, American military bases in Ukraine in any any concrete sense of the word is i think debatable and probably outright false one other thing there's no question that there was a war that occurred between ukrainians and donbas separatist fight, uh, fighters in putin's telling this all occurred because ukraine ukrainian forces neo-nazi forces decided to attack the donbas uh, region now we know, as a matter of fact, that Russian irregulars and our detachments of the Donbass were absolutely in the fight. This doesn't mean that it's one side's fault or another side's fault. But the problem with the Putin argument is, and, and the whole interview is, us good, you bad. And history is a much more complicated uh, kind of thing. One other thing, if I might add, he said, um, much of Ukraine today, at least um, east of the Dnieper, Dnipro, is uh, a gift from Russia. Well, how did Russia acquire it? <laughs> it acquired it starting with Catherine the Great from the Ottoman Empire. So what if Recep Tayyip Erdogan came up and said, you know, we want these territories back. Do you think for a moment that Putin would give it back? Yeah, and he'd go, oh, yeah, you know what? Yeah, you had it the past, so sure, here you go. Yeah, so this is the problem sure with have. redrawing borders, right? It's an endless, yeah. it's an endless task. Yeah. But right. to him, there is a historical injustice that was done to Russia, and he wants to make that very clear. If I were him, I wouldn't have gone on for an hour because you lose the folks in Iowa, even in New York, maybe. After but that's more like two or three minutes, but that's a separate issue, yeah. Correct. Uh, and, and Rebecca, let me ask you, uh, in terms of, you know, your, your book there, uh, The Mind of Putin, that you, you've talked about so much and gone into, how do you see him, th and I'm going back to 2014 there, where he's seeing these things. What was in his mind that made him say, I'm going to send in these, what they called at the time, little green men to help, you know, on the, on the, uh, the uh, ex uh, separatist side? 
uh, as opposed to, you know, I don't know, uh, something else he might have done because, you know, going in there is certainly going to be potentially getting him into a war. But why was it so important for him to, to do that, that he would risk a war uh, in, in 2014 by sending in these people? Well, uh, several things. Uh, NATO is ex expansion. While it's not the only reason why Putin invaded uh, Ukraine, it's an integral part of, of his whole decision uh, calculus. So Putin was preparing for this war for about uh, 20 years, probably since he ever um, became president, right? Um, so uh, because the fear of the United States is so deeply ingrained in the Russians and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 uh, was a huge humiliation for them. And Putin, being an intelligence operative, he wrote and spoke a lot about the kind of um, psychological blow that uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union uh, did to him. He didn't describe it in those terms. I'm describing him. But um, he, he was clearly, clearly his intention to right the wrong, so to speak. But with regard to uh, NATO expansion, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, what the Russians view as their strategic security perimeter or the so-called strategic buffer, uh, of which Ukraine is a critical part of. So that buffer has reduced from a thousand miles approximately to 100 miles. That is shorter distance than between Washington DC and New York City and no sane, uh, military commander would allow such a close proximity of an adversarial alliance, in which case is NATO, is created with the primary purpose of countering the USSR. So in Putin's mind, it is only a matter of time when the United States absorbs um, just like we did uh, in the Baltics, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Right. It's a so, so let me ask you this, though, so, and this is actually for both of you, uh, yeah. because I, you know that those uh, Stoltenberg, which I've written about several times, it was either December twenty-one or January twenty-two, just before all this, uh, when Putin had sent out a letter that said, uh, you know, here is a new proposal, which which many viewed as almost uh, this terms of surrender before any war had been fought, asking for a lot of stuff, and Stoltenberg. Uh, famously went on and said, we will not give in to any of these things. In fact, we are still going to stand by our Bucharest uh, deal in 2018. Ukraine and Georgia will still come into NATO at some point. Now, I think there's a lot of uh, evidence behind the scenes that they knew that there's no way in hell that they're going to be allowed into NATO for all the reasons that our own charter uh, lays out these conditions, which Ukraine won't meet for the indefinite future. I mean, I don't, if ever. So to what extent do you think NATO people had realized that they would not invite Ukraine in because it would be destabilizing, but they said it in public anyway. And then how, what kind of an impact did that have on Putin? Could he say, oh, you're just talking, but really you won't? Or do you say, I'm just going to take you at your word? How do those two things work together? Danny, can I, uh, before getting to the, I'm sorry, Rebecca, go ahead. Go ahead. Let me let you. Uh, well, Putin trusts U.S. leaders in NATO at the words, right? And uh, he is looking long term. He's a, uh, he's a strategic planner, right? As I said, that he was planning for this war uh, for a quarter of a century. How do we know this? We know this uh, because he is the one who sent a uh, uh, 10 agents to inserted them as a sleeper cell into the United States to collect intelligence. He did that. The FBI nabbed them in 2010 and they were operating in the United States for, for a decade. Okay, that's how we know this. So Putin believes that eventually that was going to happen. Whether mm -hmm. NATO believed their own words or not, I cannot tell. But I personally briefed NATO in um, 2013 in September in the run up to Putin's invasion of Ukraine. NATO knew how uh, Putin views this, that this was oh, wow. a red 
fine. And they proceeded nevertheless. And they didn't do anything to beef up our forced posture. And this is why President Biden declared from the very beginning of the invasion that he would never deploy U.S. forces into the theater. It's because he knew that Russia has a very sophisticated strategy that includes uh, n tactical nukes and cyber uh, weapons. And the U.S. was held by Putin at risk, preventing us from fully supporting Ukraine. Yeah, and we're actually going to talk about that in just a second, playing a, a clip related to that. Uh, Raj, go ahead. What were you going to say? Just some perspective uh, on this, Danny. There are two views of uh, Putin that still prevail today. One is that he is from start to finish an unreconstructed imperialist. And the second is that he's something of a uh, riverboat gambler. He rolls the dice and he's a risk taker. But Putin, like you or me or any historical figure, has never marched through time unchanged. So you may remember that after 9-11, Putin was the first foreign leader to call <clears throat> Bush and say, what can I do to help? Can I help open up the routes to supply Afghanistan? He was a member of the G7 and reveled in being welcomed into it. And there are statements that one can look at where Putin says, you know, Russia is part of the West. Here's where we come to NATO expansion. Um, I'm quite critical of Mr. Putin's invasion of Ukraine uh, for reasons we can get into. But I was also somebody who was opposed to NATO expansion because it was clear to me that just as we would not have tolerated the intrusion of a foreign alliance into our history, and never have since the foundation of the Republic, Russia would see this as a threat. Yeah. Now, did uh, that cause the invasion? No, but this certainly it was a background condition. As for risk taking, think about Georgia 2008. Zero risk, because he didn't try to conquer the whole country. Crimea 2014, Donbass, zero chance that any Western leader would have gone to war over that. Syria 2015, air power, no ground troops. So this is not a man who just casts caution to the wind. But the point that Tucker Carlson raised and that Putin systematically avoided was this. What was it on February 22nd 2022 that led you to t invade ukraine uncharacteristic i have to tell you honestly mm. that i was not expecting it. you and i have talked about this ad nauseum the fact is that between 2008 when at the bucharest summit ukraine was invited in some namby pamby way because george w bush strong-armed nato they didn't want to do it between 2008 and 2022 Ukraine had not made one iota of progress toward joining NATO. So the idea that NATO expansion left Putin no choice but to invade, I don't find persuasive, even though from start to finish, I've never been a proponent of NATO expansion. Yeah, I, I had this, the same, the, actually the same reaction because of that. Uh, and, and, and I did notice and was, and in fact, that was probably the number one thing I was even listening for in the entire two hour presentation was what was the spark that caused that day, as opposed to a month earlier, or a month later or whatever, why did you choose then to do it? Because he just categorically said, well, we just went in then to end it because it started in 2014. Okay. Fair enough. As far as the concepts yeah. go, but why then? And, and he never did answer the question. And and I wonder. But it was, you know, it, it was worse than that. He said, oh, I'm going to get to it. You know, what is this, an interview or a talk show? He just batted it away. And he never answered that question. So do, do you have any theories? What what do you think caused him on that day to finally, what what was it, what's it trigger? And then, I'll, Rebecca, I'll ask you the same question. Well, I've had a running debate with my friend, John Mearsheimer, who believes that it was all about NATO expansion. And I don't, for a moment, deny that NATO expansion played a role. But I come back to my unsupportable theory that during COVID, a different Putin began to emerge. Hmm. As I told you, he asked for the archives. He read widely on Imperial Russian history, especially Catherine the Great. He started reading right-wing um, philosophers. His favorite philosopher is Ivan Ilin, a uh, interwar uh, right-wing Russian nationalist. He had a lot to do with Dugin, uh, who's, a, who's a right-wing oh, philosopher yeah, yeah. in Russia. 
So there was a kind of different Putin that I saw emerge. Now, does this mean that NATO expansion had nothing to do with it? No, you can have both things going on. You can yeah. have this yeah. Putin who has a thing, view of sure. Russian history, right? But that view makes NATO expansion even more intolerable to him. So I think we like in the United so, but, States but to still, simplify what things. What was the trigger then? I don't, I don't know that. I mean, I wish I could tell you. Yeah. Excuse me. I have to tell your audience that I have COVID and I'm sniffling here. I don't mean to be uh -huh. rude. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know the answer, Dan. I've, str I've struggled every which way to try to figure this out. I lean toward the COVID period and Putin because what happened mm. in 2022 was a complete departure mm. from the Vladimir Putin we've seen since 1999 or 2000 when he became president 1999 he was prime minister yeah yeah rebecca what what do you have any theories as to what what was the spark in february 2022 yes i do um well uh first of all um i predicted putin's invasion of ukraine in my book putin's playbook russia's secret plan to defeat america so my assessment is he was preparing all along. The Russians were modernizing their uh, weaponry. They were developing very specific, sophisticated doctrine. Um, in December 2021, 20, uh, I predicted the invasion uh, within two months. I wrote a piece in the Hill that's called uh, Putin uh, is drawing a red line over Ukraine and he's serious about it. He didn't just invade on the 24th out of the blue. Remember, he took several months to uh, drag all of the forces. He assembled 190,000 troops, uh, heavy weaponry. Um, there were uh, logistics stood up. There were blood supplies, right? Uh, the reason I believe that Putin chose that particular, uh, this particular period has to do with the Russian intelligence assessment of President uh, Biden. The Russians uh, believe that President Biden is both physically and cognitively impaired, and he is also not capable of uh, delivering a, a, a strong counterpunch to Putin. He wouldn't have done, President, former President Trump is 100% correct that Putin would not have done this Absolutely. when he was president. And there are five reasons that, you know, I don't want to go through right now, yeah. uh, why Trump is the person whom Putin fears because he did very specific things um, that struck at the heart of Russia's war fighting strategy. So, so uh, first again, of all, actually, let me ask you a question. When sure. uh, you and you say you predicted it in the book, when when was the book published? I don't remember. Uh, it was published uh, in July in July 2021. Oh wow! Okay, so so you you saw all the the clouds forming even at that time. Now, one of one of our guests here, uh, one of our followers. Um, has this comment here that, that I've seen a lot of places. They say, well, it's because Ukraine increased the shelling of the Donbass, you know, in the weeks leading up to that on that. And I've seen that written a lot of places. And certainly I've seen the Russians claim it. Is there any validity to that? Look, so, uh, I don't, there, go ahead, Raj. Look, there was certainly a bloody war going on in the Donbass. But if you look at the history of our country or any other country that's faced a civil war, Nigeria in 67, 70, for example, these are bloody things. And the state's first duty is to hold its territory. So was there a lot of shelling of Donbass? Absolutely. On the other side, were the Russians supplying the Donbass separatists? And in crucial times like the Battle of the Baltseva, by the way, the Ukrainians were led by the man who is now the command, new commander in chief, Alexander Sirsky, did the Russian army intervene? Yes, it's a complicated tangle. So I don't think we're in a yeah. position to say one side did it or the other side did it. it you know, war is hell. Yeah. You know this as a combat right. veteran who's done four tours of, uh, tours of duty. Was there shelling going on? Absolutely. The Ukrainians were not willing to allow part of their country to be sliced up. Just a quick word, Danny, on the Minsk process, because Putin came back to this. The Minsk process started after the 14 war, and it was to try to work out some kind of areas of autonomy. And Putin's presentation is the Ukrainians just were not interested. 
it's a lot more complicated than that. The two sides couldn't come to an understanding of what autonomy would really mean because in the Russian eye, an appropriate level of autonomy meant almost like a confederation in which the two Donbas republics in Lugansk and Donetsk would have almost a veto power over certain things, especially foreign policy. So it wasn't that the negotiations were not going on. They were going on till the end, till, till the 2022 war began. It was a very complicated thing that was unresolved for many reasons. And to simply say the Ukrainians were never serious about it is is not true because the Russians I, had some conditions that were DOA for the Ukrainians. Yeah, I, I, I've i heard of that. And Rebecca, real quick, let me ask you to, to tag in on that before we shift to the next topic, because I don't want to like get miss a couple of things. I don't want us to run out of time. But uh, one of the other claims uh, that was in the Western media a lot uh, uh, half a year or so ago was that the uh, German and French leaders came out and said, actually, we never intended for the Minsk agreements to be uh, adopted. We just wanted it to buy time for Ukraine to build up. Is that a true rendering of what actually happened? I don't know whether the uh, Germans and the French actually meant it when they when they said that. But remember, there's such a thing as uh, Russian paranoia. Um, and what I mean by that, culturally, uh, Putin, just like all Russians, are predisposed to the worst case scenario assessment. So, yes, everything that we put out, they interpreted in much more sinister terms. And so a lot of things, as Raj says, it's a very, very complicated thing and multiple, multiple things um, um, were part of Putin's decision-making calculus. But my assessment is this war was in preparation for, for decades. We saw multiple, what we call in the intelligence community, indications and warnings, INW, that led up to it. And Putin just chose a window of opportunity during which he thought he would not receive that much resistance. Right. Yeah. Um, just to kind of give you a little heads up here. So I've got two more quick uh, topics I want to co cover because they're both very, very important uh, for the United States, especially. But I, I just want you to kind of get in your mind, because at the end, I'm going to ask you, is there anything that could have been done either by the West uh, or by Ukraine itself that could have prevented this from getting to a war Knowing what we know now, so it's easy to armchair quarterback this, but um, knowing that you're both saying that basically this was a long time in the in the running when it went up there, is there any way it could have been avoided at the time? So just kind of put that in. But right now I want to shift into a different topic uh, because it's something that is takes a lot of interest in the United States. Uh, <coughs> that is this prospect that, oh, my God, we have to defeat Russia. Otherwise, they're definitely coming west. Uh, and here's how that went in the interview. Well, the argument, I know you know this, is that, well, he invaded Ukraine. He has territorial aims across the continent. And you're saying unequivocally you don't. It is absolutely out of the question. You just don't have to be any kind of analyst. It goes against common sense to get involved in some kind of a global war. And a global war will bring all humanity to the brink of destruction. It's obvious. Now, many people could just say, oh, well, of course he's going to say no. I mean, Hitler said he wasn't going to invade other countries, too. And look how that worked out here. But as I've talked a number of times, there's also the issue of capacity. But I think within what he said there, there is some uh, there's some accuracy that if there is a clash between Russia and NATO, then I think the chances of it going nuclear are just off the charts. And I just can't imagine either side wanting to do that. So I think as far as that goes, I think that there's probably some agreement actually on both sides that that's kind of what would happen and yet we see in the u.s just a couple of days ago uh chuck schumer said this if we don't aid uh, ukraine putin will be walk all over ukraine we will lose the war and we could be fighting in eastern europe in a nato ally in a few years americans won't like that so americans seem to keep thinking that and then that specific interview was cited in in putin's uh, comments when tucker asked him this one of uh, our senior United States senators from the state of New York, Chuck Schumer, said yesterday, I believe, that we have to continue to fund the Ukrainian effort or U.S. soldiers, citizens could wind up fighting there. How do you assess that? 
This is a provocation, and a cheap provocation at that. I do not understand why American soldiers should fight in Ukraine. There are mercenaries from the United States there. If somebody has the desire to send regular troops, that would certainly bring humanity to the brink of very serious global conflict. This is obvious. Do the United States need this? What for? Wouldn't it be better to negotiate with Russia? Make an agreement, already understanding the situation that is developing today, realizing that Russia will fight for its interests to the end? And realizing this, actually return to common sense, start respecting our country and its interests, and look for certain solutions. Now, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about the negotiation thing in the next segment here, in the last segment we have coming up here. First of all, a little clarification. Tucker mis misidentified what Schumer said. Schumer didn't say U.S. would be fighting in Ukraine. He said that if they lost Ukraine, we could be fighting in NATO, which maybe that's a, a nuance, but it's an important nuance because I don't think anyone's talking about sending U.S. troops into Ukraine itself during this war here. But the bigger issue is, uh, would is the fear on the U.S. side that, Russia could roll into NATO, into Western Europe, uh, if he succeeds in Ukraine. Is there any validity to that? From from what you think, both Raj, we'll ask Raj. I'll ask you first, and then Rebecca. But you mentioned touched on this a second ago that he's very calculating. And although it's a different Putin, you think that has emerged since COVID. How do you think he views that? Even if he won, let's just say that for a second. Right. So. <clears throat> calculating doesn't mean risk-taking. So you and I can be calculating, but also cautious. My assessment of the Russian army, and you and I have discussed this at length, and we probably disagree, is that on balance against a much weaker foe, the performance has been pretty lousy. Its top flight weapon systems haven't worked well. Its logistics have broken down. Losses have been extraordinarily high. The tank balance between Ukraine and Russia now is not that far apart because of Russian losses. In Avdivka, 20,000 Russian soldiers have died so far. And there have been occasions of almost mutiny in the ranks. The 155th Marine Infantry Division was demolished so many times that it had to be reconstituted. So that the idea that a Putin who's having a hard enough time taking eastern and southern Ukraine will yeah. march across Ukraine, which is Europe's largest country, setting Western Russia aside, and attack NATO strikes me as far-fetched. I know people make this argument partly to, to gin up support for um, Ukraine militarily. And I, as you know, I'm not opposed to that. But I don't think that Putin's next step is uh, Estonia or yeah. Lithuania. Um, one of the reasons Putin <clears throat> invaded, I've talked to many Ukrainians on the ground during my four trips to Ukraine during the war is they expected a quick victory. Their intelligence on the ground, you may find this hard to believe, told them that the Ukrainians would come over there to them in large numbers. They oh, had like, that sounds they had vaguely like, familiar 2003, but anyway, continue. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a common thing that states do, right? They had a kind of uh, Kremlin stooge Viktor Medvedchuk ready to probably sit in Kiev and Russian paratroopers were actually in Kiev city. They were all killed because the armored columns couldn't get through. And let happen. me just point out one other thing that Putin said that's, that, that's laughable. He said, as a gesture of goodwill in April, oh, yeah. we removed our troops from um, Kiev and parts west. They were chased out of there. It was an yeah. abysmal right. failure. He didn't do it as a gesture of goodwill. Right. Yeah. I, I, I thought the same thing. Yeah. It, it was a goodwill that you got your troops out of harm's way, but that's a separate issue. Uh, Rebecca, what, what do you think uh, in, in terms of would Putin and even can Putin roll West in the event that somehow they won in Ukraine? Absolutely not. I believe uh, Schumer and other Washington establishment officials are either lying or they're misinformed because there's no intelligence uh, backing up the assessment that Putin will go after a NATO country. 
Putin is not suicidal. He's a rational thinker. NATO enjoys an overwhelming conventional superiority over Russia. As uh, Raj pointed out, the Russians uh, struggled to establish overwhelming dominance, even over a much smaller opponent. And so this is just used to gin up support uh, for Ukraine. Putin is correct. He has no designs on the Baltics, uh, on Poland, any other NATO country, because it would trigger Article 5. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the bottom line here. Uh, next section, the last section I want to talk here, I think is the most important thing of this entire discussion, uh, because it at least entertains the possibility that this war can come to an end at some point. And that is in the, the issue of negotiations and is Russia willing to negotiate? Now, much of the mainstream media in the West has for many months now said that, uh, you know, no, Putin is not even talking about negotiating. He's not even willing to entertain it. Uh, so there's no point in it. Uh, and as Putin said it actually correctly at one point during this interview that the uh, Ukrainian uh, parliament actually passed a bill or a law rather that prohibits anybody from talking to Russia. So it would seem that there's not any. And yet Putin had to say when, when specifically asked about that by Tucker Carlson, here's what Putin said. So I just want to make sure I'm not misunderstanding what you're saying. I don't think that I am. I think you're saying you want a negotiated settlement to what's happening in Ukraine. <laughs> right. And we made it. We prepared the huge document in Istanbul that was initialed by the head of the Ukrainian delegation. He affixed his signature to some of the provisions, not to all of it. He put his signature and then he himself said, we were ready to sign it and the war would have been over long ago, 18 months ago. However, Prime Minister Johnson came, talked us out of it, and we missed that chance. Well, you missed it, you made a mistake, let them get back to that, that is all. Now, I don't, I don't want to talk at the moment about whether Prime Minister uh, Johnson uh, actually did interview. There's a lot of communications or disputes on that, both from him personally. Uh, but I want to set that aside. But the fact that he's saying he is willing to entertain even the, the concepts that were discussed back then. Um, Rebecca, I'll start with you this time. What do you think is the the legitimacy of that? Because at least from my perspective, especially looking at it from the Russian military side, he has a lot of motivation to want to have a negotiated settlement. Whatever he may have thought he could have done in the past or in the initial part of it has been exposed as being unrealistic on the ground. And it's very unlikely he's going to be able to take a lot more ground unless the Ukraine army literally collapses. Short of that, I, I mean, they're going to be able to inch their way to the West for some period of time at a great cost. And it's coming at a cost to his country, which I'm sure he would like to end so that he can, you know, claim some kind of victory. Do you think he's serious when he says he's willing to negotiate it? And should the West follow that up? Putin is serious when he says he wants to negotiate. This is my assessment. But the nuance is that Putin wants to negotiate on his terms. Uh, A, he wants to keep the parts of Ukraine that Russia has annexed. Uh, B, he wants um, Ukraine's capit official capitulations and the removal of the Zelensky regime. And uh, he wants to install a pro-Russian uh, leader, to which none of which the West would agree to. Uh, my initial assessment uh, in the beginning of this war was that Putin would be just satisfied to keep whatever he had, you know, in the very beginning. But now he also wants to humiliate the West. He mm. wants the Biden administration and NATO to beg him to end this war because he's in a strong position right now. He is, he understands that there's no... Uh, military path for victory. It's mathematically impossible for Ukraine. He also understands that the United States has depleted its own um, weapons arsenal while we were trying to bleed Russia. Russia is economically in a strong position right now because its military industrial complex was thriving. Sanctions uh, have to some extent backfired at us with an election um, season right now. So he is calculating that unless he uh, gets from the West the admission that they lost, mm. he is not going to negotiate. 
And and Raj, uh, over to you, because uh, you've been on the ground several times. You just mentioned you've been there four times during the war itself. So you know the Ukraine side pretty well. You've written a book there. You spent time in there before the war started. Talk a little bit about how you see this 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 comment coming from the Ukraine side, because as Rebecca just pointed out, there are a couple of really powerful incentives in opposite directions pressing against Ukraine. Number one, militarily, uh, I personally see no path to military victory, that they can defeat Russia, that they can drive them out on a military basis for many reasons. Uh, and I'm sure that they see that the, the, if not the difficulty, the near impossibility of that. So if they keep fighting, they're going to keep dying and keep losing. But if they negotiate, it could literally mean they're going to negotiate themselves, the leaders, out of a job. It will be humiliating. And, and they there's such hatred among some quarters in Ukraine for the Russians. How do you see this playing in them? And, and with these dynamics on there, what do you think is going to happen? A couple of things, Danny. <clears throat> Without American support, military support, that exceeds all of America's allies put together, Ukraine will have a very hard time sustaining this war because Europe, given its historic neglect of defense spending and defense industries, it's changing now, is not in a position to step into the breach. So, for example, they were supposed to deliver 1 million artillery shells by March. They won't even meet that target till the end of the year. They delivered 500,000. So things are looking good for Putin, especially what's going on in our Congress. Uh, in our Congress. But could I add one detail just to stage a mini rebellion? It's a very important thing we need to talk about because Putin said this whole war could have been agree, uh, avoided because there was an agreement beforehand, very quickly. Before the war, Andrei Yermak, who is arguably the second most important person in Ukraine, chief of staff to Zelensky, and Dmitry Kozak, who were negotiating the Minsk Accords, got together and Yermak said to him on a separate issue, Zelensky is prepared to put NATO expansion, uh, Ukraine's NATO membership on the table. Uh, Kozak came back and said, no, that we want uh, Ukraine surrender. Then there were negotiations in Gomel, Belarus, after the war, and then in uh, Istanbul, and a brief meeting between the two prime ministers, in uh, foreign ministers, sorry, in Antalya, Turkey. The Ukrainians were prepared to forego NATO expansion because Zelensky said, I don't think we'll get into NATO. And meanwhile, the Russians. I remember that publicly. How I it remember. So the deal fell apart for many complicated reasons how to deal with Crimea, how to deal with Donbass, and so on. As for Boris Johnson, I know you don't want to get into this, uh, that he stopped the deal. The idea that Boris Johnson could come waltzing in and, and tell the Ukrainians not to negotiate is ridiculous. But by April, the Ukrainians had lost the incentive to negotiate for two reasons. First, the atrocities in Bucha were discovered. That yeah. changed the entire right. character of the attitude toward Russia in Ukraine. Second, the Ukrainian army looked like it was on a roll. And so the pressure right. to negotiate yeah. had atrophied, right? So there's a little bit, and, and Putin keeps brandishing this document. Here, I have this document, it's signed. He's never released it. He, he mentioned David Arhamia, the interlocutor, from uh, Zelensky's side. Arhamia said, if he has the document, why doesn't he release it? Oh, it. <laughs> so, so where are we now? What, with Given that history, what's going on in Kiev right now? How do they view this? They are very, very short of just about everything. Artillery, an eight to one advantage, combat troops, you can say Russia's taken more casualties than Ukraine, whether you believe that or not separate. It doesn't matter because they right. just have a much larger population, right? So there's an old saying, God is on the side of the bigger battalions. And that's the way it's going to be unless there is an agreement to sustain American aid. Time is not working in favor of Ukraine. Putin understands this very well. He's prepared to run out the clock. As for negotiations, you know, he, he goes back and forth. He said, oh, we're willing to negotiate, so Ukrainians won't negotiate. In December, he had this mega press conference. You know, he gets calls yeah. from everyone in the country, and he sits and answers them. He said, the special military operation, by the way, he'll never call it a war, has not yet achieved its objectives, and we have more objectives to achieve. So which is it? Do you want to negotiate, or do you want to achieve more objectives? Because if you right. want to achieve more objectives, then there's no negotiation to be had. So does Ukraine then just 
keep fighting, even though all of these balances of power you're talking about are continuing to move it in the wrong direction, where they're going to lose more troops, but not be able to stop Russia methodically moving forward? Or do they eat all their pride and, and bring it, at least try to bring it to a negotiated settlement? Where, where does Kiev go from here? I'll let Rebecca speak because I had a chance. Rebecca, what do you think? Hey, and then we'll, um, we'll change it my up. Assessment, my assessment is that there's a, a division within uh, Zelensky's regime uh, on what to do. Zelensky is unwilling to negotiate. He stated it uh, time and time again that his idea of a military victory is to expel the Russians from the entire land of Ukraine, including Crimea. Zelensky also has built his entire image uh, on the idea of defeating Russia, right? He's now revered in the West. He's viewed as a Churchill in T-shirt. And uh, for him, you know, to negotiate with Russia, this would be the end of Zelensky. And yeah. so that is not feasible. On the other end, this is why he... Um, just expelled uh, General Zaluzhny from uh, from his post um, because Zaluzhny was quite more realistic. And yeah. so uh, tragically, it appears as though Ukraine is going to be destroyed and cease to exist as a viable uh, uh, country. It's been depopulated uh, right now. The average... Um, age of a Ukrainian soldier is 43 and it's rising. And it's just simply tragic that because the two sides, and by two sides, I mean Moscow and Washington, because it is a proxy war between Russia and the United States over the control of Ukraine that the Russians perceive as part of their strategic security perimeter and the United States believes that Ukraine has a right to be a democracy. Yeah. Although nothing can be further from the truth Ukraine and democracy does not even align, cannot even be used in the same uh, sentence. Uh, Ukraine is just as corrupt as Russia. But nevertheless, the country is right now being annihilated because the two sides cannot come to an agreement. Yeah. And, and I, that's that's one of the things that is the most that is the most anguishing thing of all two years of this has been that the the bill payers for all of these entities that are you know in the positions of authority are the Ukrainian people and the cities and their future uh, and it just anguishes me to see that just being methodically mowed down. Uh, folks, I really appreciate you guys coming on today. Uh, this has been so enlightening and so helpful, especially to try to help interpret some of the things that were said that we might not have known otherwise. The last thing I would like to ask each of you is what I mentioned a minute ago is, was there actually a chance to have prevented war? Is there anything the West could have done? We can't do anything about the other side of the equation. But in that lead up, in those, whether it's from 2014 all the way or just the last five or six months, is there anything that could have been done to prevent war? Or do you think Putin was con intent on doing it and it wouldn't have mattered in the West. Uh, Raj, first to you. I think the decision to force the Europeans to issue this vague invitation to Ukraine in 2008 really changed things. And if they were not going to invite or really admit them, they did them a terrible disservice because the temperature between Russia and Ukraine arose. And when Putin attacked, Ukraine was left uh, friendless. On the question of whether the war could be uh, could have been avoided, I've already said, given you my views on the uh, negotiations just before the war and just after the war, it's very complicated. Those of you who want to, to see my views on this, I've written a long piece in the National Interest looking through step by step what happened there. Um, you know, Danny, uh, Zelensky can't say we want to negotiate because it will create a rift in Ukraine. It will also destroy morale. On the other hand, you can't fight with sticks and stones. If yeah. you don't have equipment coming through, you face a very serious problem. I went to the front lines and I saw troops whom I've known for a long time and fatigue is etched on their face because they've been fighting not so since 2002 only, some since 2004. It's taking a toll on family relationships. They know that people in the rear are dodging the draft. They need to retrain, uh, mobilize and retrain about 350,000 troops. That's going to be very hard. And there's a big racket of draft division going on. So there's a very big problem that they face. I don't want to minimize it. I'll just say one other thing. If you look at the front lines in all of 2003, the Russian army hasn't done all that well. The net gain was about 180, 
square kilometer, uh, square kilometers, right? Yeah. So it's not a big, big showing. What happens now is a separate story from now on. Yeah. And Rebecca? I believe this war hypothetically could have been uh, avoided. The reason I say hypothetically is because the conditions that uh, Putin placed on the West uh, would were not achievable for the United States and NATO, and that is he wanted legal guarantees that Ukraine will not be part of NATO. So my assessment is that it could have been delayed, but not avoided altogether, because eventually Putin would have found a way to um, to try to absorb Ukraine, because just like I said, uh, he views Ukraine as part of a strategic security perimeter, and he needed his legacy. He's thinking long term. He equates himself with Russia, and he thought that sooner or later, this uh, issue needs to be resolved, and he's the best person uh, to resolve it. That's why he enjoys uh, and still 80% of, uh, of approval rating. Uh, Thank you. Thank you both. I'm sorry. I I literally uh, have to jump because I've got another TV interview to do. I just remembered about. uh, Thank you so much for coming. And we thank you all for uh, coming on today. Uh, Bob Putin's playbook uh, with Rebecca uh, Koffler. And and also don't forget uh, about her. uh, uh, What is it called? The the, uh, cut to the news news newsletter. If you want, go to her website and, and click on that. Thank you, folks. And we will see you on the next episode of Daniel Davis Deep Dive.